Uh, we talked about addition and, and subtraction and how that worked out the way you expected it. But the product rule, however, is slightly different. Um, it's not that bad to remember. So let's just take a look at it from the start and then I'll show you how it gets there. So if you take the derivative of two functions that are multiplied together, so f of x times g of x, then what we can do is we can come up with a rule for finding that derivative and it goes like this. Basically, each one gets a turn being the derivative, which is a little surprising. It doesn't work out the way you'd expect. Not quite as obvious, but um, this is where f gets a turn being derivative, and then in the other piece, g gets a turn being the derivative. So we can extend this to lots of different derivatives, and uh, as long as everybody gets one turn, it'll be correct. Yeah? It's added, yes, it's always added in this, in this form, right? It may be that the derivative spits a negative out, but th this is, yeah. Okay, so let's take a look at the proof, which comes from the definition of derivative here. So, um, if I'm multiplying two functions together, then this is the one that I'll have. So it'll be at delta x. Okay, now I'm going to do a little trick here to uh, help with some factoring. Again, this is kind of like the genius step in doing this proof. If you can get past this step, then uh, the rest of it's not so bad. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in this piece. And then I'm going to subtract the same piece just to balance it out. And what I just added was this. And that whole thing is equal to zero. So now I'm going to rearrange it so it looks like the definition of derivative a little more. So this would be the limit as delta x goes to 0. And the pieces I'm going to work on, for example, if I took them like this, And I'll have this piece. So let me just show you what I took out. I just took out this one and this one. And then I'm going to write the other one as a different... Uh, fraction as well. So I'm just going to split those two up so it's easier to see where I'm headed. So this will be plus um, f of x uh, g of x So all I did, again, was split up those two fractions, because now what I'm going to want to do is factor out uh, some of the common pieces. So for example, in the first one, I'm going to factor out this f of x plus delta x, and in the second one, I'm going to factor out this g of x. So what I end up with is the limit as delta x goes to 0, and in the first one, it's going to have g of x plus delta x minus g of x divided by delta x. And I apologize, I am running out of space here, but hopefully I can fit this in. And then I'll factor out the g of x on the second piece. So f of x 
plus delta x um, minus f of x. So at this point, hopefully you recognize what you're looking at. Um, I'm just going to walk you through what happens here. After that clever addition that I made and then separating the two fractions, here's what I have. The first piece, as delta x goes to 0, that's just going to become f of x. So that's just gone. Do you recognize this here? I hope. What is that? Yeah. The derivative of what? Of g of x, right. So it would be g prime of x plus, now the other piece is still just g of x. It didn't really change. What's this here? Derivative of f, yeah. So again, it's kind of surprising that it turns out this way. It's still not super complicated, but it is not okay to assume that you just multiply the two derivatives. Each one gets a turn as derivative, like I'm showing you here in red. Okay. So remember, as your first course on calculus, part of my job is to show you how mathematicians prove these things that you end up using. Um, it is not the expectation that you do this for me, but it is the expectation that you have some exposure to it. Um, next year in university, your professors may have that expectation, but you get away with it for one more year at least. Okay, so let's practice it. This is where um, we're going to be de dedicating ourselves today is using this product rule. This one's not so bad. We could just use like um, FOIL and expand this out, but let's try doing it with the product rule instead. Okay, first one, let's call this my f of x, and then we'll call this my g of x. We're going to pretend these are two different functions being multiplied together. So we're going to give each one of them a turn. So the derivative is going to be, what's the derivative of f? Minus 4x, good. So you still hopefully remember the power rule. Minus 4x here. And what's uh, this one? We just leave it. 5 plus 4x. It's not its turn yet. And again, if I'm switching, it's not this first piece's turn. It's the second one's turn to be derivative. So what's the derivative for g of x on this? Yeah. Okay, so... There's its turn as derivative, and there's its turn as derivative. G prime, F prime. Okay. So you try the product rule. See what you can come up with then for these derivatives um, that follow. Okay, so let's check the first one here. I realize some of you might need some more time for the other one. But uh, if I was to show you my work, the first piece gets a turn as derivative. That's just going to be 1. Then the second piece gets a turn as derivative. And remember, this is your favorite one. It never changes. Oh, sorry. Yes, it's frozen on your screen. There we go. So you should see something like this. And if you wanted to tidy it up, you get um, e to the x plus x times e to the x. Can I just see how many people got that one? Yeah, OK. So again, it's not that it's scary, it's just that it's not obvious that it would do this if we, uh, if we take the product of two things for a derivative. Okay, last piece, can I see, is, is there people need more time to try the last one? Okay, so I'll give So for the last one, these are the pieces you've got. You have the derivative of the first piece. And it won't matter what you do with that 2. Like if you consider the function just x, that's fine, right? The multiplication by a constant won't change. But um, you should have two pieces, first one, and then the derivative of the second piece. And this last piece is not multiplication. It's just last day's uh, basic derivative rules. So the derivative of sine is cosine. That's why I end up with minus 2 cosine here. So if I finish this off... The derivative is going to be 2 cos x, and that's negative sine, so minus 2x sine x, 
minus 2 cos x. And I might as well tidy this up a bit. The derivative is going to be 4, uh, sorry, 2 cos x minus, uh, these would be gone. So minus 2x sine x is the uh, end result there. Tidy it up. Okay, so what I was saying earlier about extending it, um, the way the pattern would work is each one gets a turn. So I'll let f be the derivative in my first piece. Then I'll let g be the uh, derivative in the next piece. It, it, the order doesn't matter here because we're using uh, multiplication and addition. But as long as each one gets a piece, you can uh, keep uh, extending this pattern out to many products. Right, so there's its turn first, then it gets the second turn, and then the last turn there. Okay, so if you ever faced with products of functions and you're trying to find its derivative, you know that uh, you can split it up by giving each one a turn at it. So the last one I'll have you try then is that idea of now you have three functions here, x squared sine x cos x. See if you can apply the pattern to this last function here. Okay, um, so this would be what I would expect most of you found for your derivative, and that should be entirely correct. Now, just realize there are trig identities in there that your textbook may choose to use. So know that you may not see the exact same answer there as the textbook might have when you're doing your homework. Just, uh, anyway, double check your trig uh, identities there. You could simplify this a bit using those. Okay, the quotient rule is our last one here as far as the basic operations of arithmetic. So when you're dividing two things, again, this derivative is not going to be entirely obvious to you, but if you have two functions, f of x, g of x, if you want their derivative, the way it works is it's similar. The derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. So it's, it's similar in that they do sort of get a turn, only this time it's subtraction. And that has to do with that division there. It's no, not a multiplication, it's a division. And then on the bottom, there's the bottom squared. And again, the proof is very similar. They add a piece into it, just like we did in the first one. However, it involves fractions and common denominators, and yuck, we're not going to do it. <laughs> so if you do want to check it out, take a look in your textbook, but it's very similar. So this is a quotient rule. It should also be one of those things that you have at hand that you know uh, until you get used to using it. It should be uh, something that you keep nearby. And again, I know I, I freaked everybody out when I said there's no formula sheet. I promise you, as ugly as that looks, no one ever has a problem with this by May. This is one of the like, first math classes you'll probably take where the whole thing is cumulative. As we go on in this course, you're going to keep using this you know, as we do things. So it'll be all the way until your exam in May that you'll see this. So it's still going to be something fresh in your mind. Okay, so if we, if we have that product rule... Um, Let's take a look at, say, this first one. How could you use the product rule on it? Oops. Uh. All right. So this is the top function. So those of you who want to label these, that's your f of x, and that's your g of x. 
So if I want the derivative the derivative of the top, what's the derivative of the top going to be? Just get some practice with your basic rules. What's it going to be? 5, good. And the bottom is x squared plus 1. And now we subtract. The derivative of the bottom is 2x, so it's going to be 5x minus 2 times 2x all over x squared plus 1 squared. I think I mentioned the one thing I really don't like about your textbook is the great links they go to to do algebra. So I'm quite happy with doing your homework to this point. You may want to practice a couple of them just to simplify it out and make sure that you're, you know, you're still fresh with those skills. But I'm quite happy with this on your, your quizzes and tests unless I otherwise say simplify completely or as much as possible. Um, you don't need to go to those links unless I specifically tell you. So um, there may be questions later on. You'll see where it does make a big difference whether you simplify or not. But at the moment, I'm more concerned about your skills of doing the derivative than your algebraic ones. Okay, this next question here also is going to use the quotient rule, and we could just jump right into it the way it is, but it'll definitely make life easier if, if you do a multiplication first. So if we were to simplify this thing and multiply the top and bottom both by x, then I would get y equals 3x minus 1 over x squared plus 5x. See if you can now come up with a derivative for that quotient um, or rational function. All right, so this is what you should have for your, pro, uh, your quotient rule. 3 times x squared plus 5x minus 3x minus 1 times 2x plus 5 all over the bottom squared. So this is one thing which clearly is not the nicest to work with. Sometimes you can avoid it, but sometimes you can. So sometimes it's, it pays to think a little bit first. Like, I have some students who will look at this question and decide that this is a quotient rule question, and they will treat that as the function 9 and the function 5x squared. Yes, that's correct, and yes, you can get the right answer, but if you were to just give it yourself an extra minute to think about it, um, you could rewrite this as 9 over 5, x to the negative 2, and now you only have to do it with the power rule, right? So this would become... Um, negative 18 over 5, x to the negative 3. And I didn't have to rely on that uh, fairly fancy-dancy, ugly formula there for quotient rule. Um, the next one here, again, it pays to think about it before you start. Rather than jump right in on autopilot, here's what we could do. Just take that constant out for a second and let me show you what I can tidy up. So after all of that, it should simplify to just a simple constant, negative 6 over 7. Oh, did I forget a negative? Oh, there's another negative. Right. Thank you. So that means it'll be positive when I'm done, right? 
Now I know you might be thinking, I don't always catch those things that you're doing, so am I in trouble? Again, it's not that it won't work, it's just that that's a lot easier to calculate the derivative than to just jump into autopilot, see the fraction, and do the product or the quotient rule. Okay? So there are some remaining trig functions that you need to know. So I am going to put them up there for you. Do these uh, show up on your formula sheet? Are they on the formula sheet? Are they on the formula sheet? There is no formula sheet, right. So unfortunately, the reality is right now, we're going nice and slow. We're splitting this unit into two. We will do lots of review while you get used to these basic rules. They are there, as I mentioned, the inside of your textbook shows them. You need to learn half of them. So uh, that'll be the whole semester's worth of memorization is those half. Today it includes these additional four for the remaining trig identities, okay? So now, um, by the way, is, can anybody figure out why they were left up until this point? How could you prove this? How could you prove that? Quotient rule is excellent. How would I do it then? Using sine and cosine. Right. So this is the same thing as the derivative of sine x over cos x. So now that you know the quotient rule and you know sine and cosine's derivative, you could go and figure this out without the formula, right? But again, we want to. Those are those are some derivatives you're going to have at the front of your mind. Um, it's something that you, is worth knowing rather than to work it out every time. Um, but they all work out that way. We're all we're using them all using a product rule. So, okay. So this time we have to di uh, differentiate using our new derivatives. So give those a try. One has a product rule in it. Hopefully, again, that you're just getting used to those basic rules. I know it's going to take some time for you to get quick at them, but believe me, you will, even if you're not there today. And of course, I mentioned trig identities certainly can help you. If you recognize something that can be cut down so that you don't have to deal with this, can anybody explain to me how on earth did I, these two things are equivalent, how on earth did I do that? There's a, there's a real sneaky trick here with fractions. It doesn't really have to do with trig, but the first part is just, yeah, you can separate those two fractions. So I wrote it this way to start, 1 over sine x minus cos x over sine x. So I ended up with um, cosecant of x minus cotangent of x. So here's the only part where it runs into problems. How many of you remember those derivatives right now? If you had to close your eyes and not look at your sheet, how many of you remember those derivatives? Yeah, only Tony does. <laughs> um, so if you didn't remember it, this might be more convenient to use because you, hopefully at this point you remember those derivatives. You could still do the qu uh, quotient rule, right? But uh, for now, anyways, just remember that identities can be helpful in cutting down the amount of work. There is no um, product rule or anything like that or quotient rule here. It's just simply using the two derivatives, just subtraction, really. It's, there's, no, there's no rule to worry about. All right, so we're going to take a look at uh, higher order derivatives. So what this means is the derivative of a derivative. 
And that really, it sounds complicated, but I'll tell you it's, it's not so bad. You already do this. We've talked about it briefly, actually. Does anybody know where I was talking about it before? What comes to mind when you hear the word derivative? Slope, Slope rate of change. Excellent. Okay. So if you use the words rate of change instead of derivative in this sentence, the rate of change in the rate of change... Yeah, acceleration was what we talked about here because the rate of change is velocity, you, how your position changes over time, and the change in the change in your position is the acceleration. I know it's a mouthful, but it's, anyways, it is actually a practical application. So um, that means if you have the function, usually the way we're given it in AP is they give us a position and it's f of x. That means the first derivative is going to be the velocity the change in position, and that's just f prime of x. And the second derivative is acceleration. Now there's a very complicated way of saying second derivative. It looks like that. It's just two tick marks instead of one. And at some point, mathematicians get really lazy, like usually if we're going to the third derivative or fourth derivative, and they would just write it like this. That would be the fourth derivative of x. So as you get higher up, you won't see the tick marks anymore. It usually just turns into a number. However, 99.99% .99 of the time, this is the world that we live in. We don't tend to go much further than the acceleration or change in the change. So here's an example. On the moon, there's no atmosphere. Objects fall without air resistance. Um, that's why you need a mask, by the way. Don't go to the moon without your oxygen tanks. Um, the position function for objects on the moon drop from 2 meters is given by this. Um, what's the velocity? So what would the velocity be equal to? So for this one, the velocity is negative 1.62t, just using the simple power rule that we've already learned. But if I want to know what's the, ex force, the acceleration on the moon due to gravity, then I have to take um, the derivative of the velocity, which is the second derivative of the position, and that's just going to be negative 1.62. So the acceleration is constant, like on the Earth, 9.86 meters per second squared, um, but on the moon it would be 1.62 meters per second squared. <laughs>